other stuff, all the other clutter that we get ourselves involved in. Really, all we need is you. And thank you for that reminder this morning, Lord. That we do only need you in our lives. You are the only one that can fill those voids, that can quench those thirsts that we have. Lord, for all that you've done and all that you're going to do, we give you thanks and we give you glory. Lord, because you are worthy this morning. You are worthy. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our praise, Lord. We exalt you this morning, Lord. We bring you glory. As the angels cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence. We welcome your power to do what only you can do in and through each one of our lives this morning. We give you the rest of the service. Pray, Lord, that the words that I'm about to share would go deep into our spirits, would penetrate, Lord, into our lives. Lord, that our gaze would be fixed on you and only you this morning. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I pray for those this morning that are experiencing doubt. I pray for those that are experiencing discouragement. Lord, I pray that before the end of the service, that both of those people, Lord, would sense your power in a new way today. And Lord, that the joy of the Lord, your joy would fill their hearts, would fill their lives. Even at this moment, I come against those things that are distracting from you in Jesus' name. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said this morning, amen, amen. I was picking up my children from school one day this week, and this individual who follows us on Twitter came to me, and I didn't know this person. I haven't talked to this person before. I've seen this individual stands often by themselves over on the sidelines, and not often a lot of people around this individual, very quiet nature, and uh, this person approached me this week and said, you don't know me, but I've been following your church on Twitter and, and wanted to clarify that uh, this person wanted nothing to do with church. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well then why are you following on Twitter? But of course I didn't say that. And I'm just, I know what the Spirit of the, the, Spirit of the Lord is doing in this moment. And uh, this individual had seen a, the poster that we've been circulating uh, around about the service tonight and this person said you know I, I'd really like to come this is the person that doesn't want anything to do with church I'd really like to come to this service but and tears began to fill I don't have enough gas to go all the way to your church and I said well that's that's great because you know the, the service isn't happening at at our church, the service is happening, you know, in sound. At, at Rock, do you know where Rockcliffe is? And he said, no. And, and I said, well, do you, do you know where the Greenwood Cemetery is? No. And right away I knew that this individual is not uh, necessarily from the Owen Sound area uh, because if people needed directions to the church, well, we'd often say, do you know where the, where the graveyard is? And everybody knew. And... Uh, Anyways, took a few moments, described the location, and I'm just really believing tonight that that person is going to show up to church tonight and receive the saving power of Jesus Christ. You know what, friends? I love to talk about Jesus. I love to talk about Jesus. Do you? He's my best friend, Jesus. I talk to him every day. Do you? Is he your best friend? Is Jesus done so much for you? Does it, does it radiate out of your personality? Does it radiate out of your being? Because you are just so thankful 
for what Jesus Christ has made possible in your life. My friends, today I can tell you with total assurance that I would not be standing up here today if it were not for the saving power of Jesus Christ, if it were not for Jesus coming in to this young man's heart and making a difference in my life so that I can go and talk about him and he can make the difference in other people's lives. I love to share the message of the cross, the redemptive story. I love to talk about the grace of God. And you know what, friends? The more I'm studying, the more I'm discovering about God's grace, the more humbled I am that He made it available to me. I am not worthy, but He still paid the price. He still died on that cross for me and for you. And I've said this before, and I say it again. If I was the only person, Jared, if you were the only person, Susan, if you were the only person on the face of this earth, he would have still died. He would have went through all of that pain, all of that torture. He would have been nailed to the cross for you. That's how personal our relationship with Jesus is. And I'm thankful for that. The last few months at this church have been very busy. We've had a tremendous, tremendous amount of things, events, funerals, services, business meetings. It's been a tremendous amount of stuff. It's all been stuff that we needed to do. Things, moments, journeying together. With those moments, it was tiring on many of us, myself included. I'm not going to say that I wasn't tired. I was. In fact, this week I came to a conclusion that I needed to change the pace a little bit. Over the last couple of months, I became incredibly behind on on some administrative duties, and I was sitting at my desk feeling totally overwhelmed this week, and and the Spirit of the Lord uh, began to speak into my spirit And he basically said to me and my spirit, slow down. Slow down. And so I did. I slowed down a little bit and began to take a few moments every day for myself. And I'm glad I did. Because I'm feeling better than I have been. I don't know if you can tell, but there's a fresh fire in my bones this morning. Amen. I've had some time to recoup. I've had some time to regenerate. I've had some time to talk about Jesus. Yesterday, I spent most of the day talking about Jesus with people who don't know Jesus, and that gets me excited. I love to talk about Jesus this morning. If you brought your Bibles with you or your electronic version of choice, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8, we're going to zero in this morning on verses 1 through 10. Let's dive in for 20 minutes this morning. The Jews had just returned from 70 years of foreign captivity in Babylon. And while they were in Babylon, the Jews were not able to practice their religion in its entirety. In fact, for the most part, they did not even have access to to the law of God. For most of the captives, whether they knew about their faith, whatever they knew about their faith came from memory or the memories of others. By the end of 70 years, they had forgotten far more than they had remembered about the will of God. After having rebuilt the temple and having just completed rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem so that they might enjoy security from their enemies, Ezra, the priestly scribe, believed it was time to begin teaching the people the Holy Scriptures. The Bible says in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 to 9, it says, And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate, And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand 
what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and who and those who could understand. And all the ears of the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. As he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. So here's what this is saying here this morning. As the word of God was shared, they were, the people were, profoundly grieved. They were convicted. The more they heard, the more they realized just how much their fathers and they themselves had strayed from the will of God. Their failure was evident. Their guilt was obvious, and they felt it very deeply. And so the Bible describes here their actions in an incredibly amazing way. It says they wept in sorrow. I shared this Bible story with you today to bring alive and to cast some light on the fact that in our spiritual lives, sorrow for our sin can be a wonderful thing. In the New Testament, Paul speaks in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Paul says, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. And I like this part at the end of the verse. It says, leading to salvation. I want you to remember this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, as we explore this this morning. In other words, today, when we realize how much we have fallen short of the righteousness and holiness of a holy God and how we have offended Him, how we have spurned His will and rebelled against the One who is so loving and kind, it should, by default, as far as my convictions go, it should generate remorse within our hearts. It should cause us some grief some shame and some sorrow. I believe that, friends, I believe that it is high time that we as a, as a church of Jesus Christ, as believers, begin to become offended by the things that offend God. Such sorrow is good if it brings repentance. Sorrow is beneficial if it causes us to humble ourselves, confess our sins, seek His gracious forgiveness, thank you Jesus, and motivate us to make a decision to change our ways and begin the process of becoming more like Christ. I don't know about you today, but I'm on a journey to become more like Jesus, amen? Are you on that journey this morning too, to become more like Jesus? How many know that we have a long way to go? I got both hands up. I'd have both feet up too, but that would be kind of awkward, wouldn't it? However, this morning, there is a sorrow that is not the will of God. There is a sorrow that can be counterproductive. This is excessive sorrow or despair. Friends, it is destructive 
when we continue to feel grief and sorrow. After, after we have been convicted of our sins, after we have confessed them to God, after we have sought forgiveness and made the commitment to change, after confession and forgiveness. I love this about the grace of God. Do you know what, friends? God wants to be replaced this morning and maybe some of you today for a second or third or fourth or maybe for the first time, God wants to replace the grief and sorrow that you're feeling today with a sense of joy, with a sense of purpose. Friends, every single one of you is born for a purpose. A purpose to serve. And know him. The prophet Isaiah foresaw the ministry of our Redeemer in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. That ministry is foretold, and this is an awesome scripture. Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3, probably one of my favorite portions of the Bible. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives to, and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. Listen to Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3 in the message translation this morning. It is awesome. Listen to how it's worded. The Spirit of the Lord, the Master, is on me because God anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, announce freedom to all captives, Pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of his grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort all who mourn, to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit, Rename them oaks of righteousness planted by God to display his glory. Don't you just love the wording as that's penned? It paints such a beautiful picture in your mind. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus proclaimed, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, Jesus proclaimed, Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn. They shall be comforted. That is the essence of the gospel, friends. That is the essence this morning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that if you mourn over your sins, Jesus will give you comfort. Jesus will give you joy, a joy unspeakable. I love that song. I remember it when I was a child, and every once in a while it pops up, and joy unspeakable. You know the song. You probably have it playing in your head right now, and you'll have it playing for the rest of the day. That's okay. There's worse songs that can be playing in your head. My daughter, one morning, she likes the iPad in the morning, and it's amazing how she can operate that thing, and every morning there's this song and it's daddy fingers yeah and if you're if you're young and you have kids today you understand what i'm talking about daddy fingers well that's the song i woke up to one morning this week and you know i had that song playing in my head all day long <laughs> daddy fingers daddy fingers yeah <laughs> the good news joy. You know, there's a few things that Satan relishes more than a Christian who is in despair over their sins. When a Christian lacks spiritual comfort and joy, 
the deceiver, Satan, rejoices because that Christian is under Satan's thumb. That Christian is not as beneficial to the Lord and no threat to Satan. Let me explain. Let's return back to Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. It says, Then Nehemiah, who was a governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all of the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I want you to remember that this morning. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Church, the strength we need to live a godly life comes not from excessive sorrow. It comes not from despair, but from our joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. Despair, friends, does not promote growth. Despair does not promote transformation. Despair does not promote thanksgiving and praise and worship. Despair knows no victory over temptation and trial. But joy is the power that produces a successful, thank you Lord, and a victorious, thank you Lord, fruit-bearing Christian. It is my belief, friends, that the reason why many people do not grow spiritually and do not do great works for the Lord is because they totally lack spiritual joy in their lives. Friends, I get it, and we all have a bad day. How many have been to the Tim Hortons drive through this week? Or been through an intersection where there's a slow driver or a highway where you're behind a slow driver? Okay, I understand we have weak moments where we might not always feel the joy. Okay, I get it. Do you have children at home? There are moments when you're not bubbling with joy, right? But you know what? We should be people of joy. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, friends, who have received the truth that has set us free, friends, those chains have been broken. And for some of you, those chains were so strong that when, when those chains got cut loose, there was freedom. And you need to be reminded of that today, that freedom, that joy. That joy of the Lord. But many lack that spiritual joy. I bump into so many people that just seem to have no joy. Why is this? When Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 14, verse 17. And Paul says that the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Why are so many members, why are so many people of God, of the Lord's church, lacking in peace and joy? Maybe part of it is that we are scared. We're scared of being like the holy rollers that squash any expression of, of enthusiasm or gladness in our worship. I mean, God forbid that we get excited in church. I was watching this amazing YouTube video this morning, you know, because that radio song that I heard this morning, Risen, it really captivated my attention. And so this morning when I got to my computer here at the office, I, I Googled the artist and I Googled the name and uh, it was Israel Hooten from uh, New Breed and uh, you're, you're all going to go home and check it out and there's, there's some videos there and I'm telling you, that place, I don't know where it was, but that place just erupted in joy and excitement. And I'm sitting in my chair and tapping my feet, and I'm thinking, man, this, this is great. These, these people have a joy moving around. Now, I'm not suggesting here today that we all have to hang from the chandeliers and walk upside down. And I'm not suggesting that. But what posture is your spirit in? 
when you're worshiping the Lord. That's what I'm asking. Because I believe that our expression as the Holy Spirit begins to move is not going to be contrary to our makeup as a person. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you're quiet by nature, then jumping around is not going to be something that you do. But if you are the kind of person like Jared that loves to jump around, then maybe that's how you're going to express your worship. And we need to, we need to allow that within reason. Jared. Jared, within reason. Do you think that we need to, as a church, examine examine our ministries and see how we might foster joy and peace in people at all times? Examine our lives. We've got to understand that the joy of the Lord is the church's strength. Come on. We're not going to get anywhere if we don't have joy. Friends, the world is watching more than you realize and whether or not you have a Facebook account or a Twitter account or an email address whether or not you have any of that stuff let me tell you today that it doesn't matter the church of Jesus Christ is being watched is being watched in the grocery store we're being watched in our own backyards have you watched the news this week people getting in trouble for letting their kids play in the backyard friends we are we are being watched everywhere. Let's live a proper example for Jesus Christ this morning. And, and that involves us looking at our lives and starting to get offended by the things that offend God. You know, if we did an inventory in here, and I'm not going to, of all, the, of, all of our lives, I'm sure that, that we would be astonished with some of the stuff that, that we are involved in that is contrary to the Word of God. You know, friends, we don't hear a lot of preaching about that, but... I preach about it. You know why? Because I've seen what it's done in my life. You know what? There are things that we get involved in, unknowingly or not, that derail us from God's purpose. And sometimes we just need to look in the mirror and say, what are those things? A big part of the problem is the deceiver. A big part of the problem is Satan. The Bible says in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 10, that the old devil is, the Bible says, and I quote, the, the accuser of the brethren. In that role, the, do, the devil strives to snatch peace and joy from our souls. You know what, friends? If the devil can take our joy, he has got us. He works hard. He works hard to discourage us by whispering lies into our minds. Perhaps you've heard him whisper to your mind saying things like, you are no good. God's not pleased with you and he never will be. You're a loser. You have so many faults and weaknesses, you'll never be able to live a Christian life. You'll never be able to please God. You don't read your Bible enough. And on and on and on. You might feel that you give up. Does this sound familiar? Have you had those thoughts? Have you ever believed these accusations and experienced the resulting feelings of defeat and despair? If you haven't, that's great. However, you would be surprised how many among us today, even in this room, are experiencing these thoughts. Can I tell you something today? Can I encourage you today, if you're not already encouraged, friends, these are lies from the devil himself. And I believe that he wants to set you free from those things today. That you walk out of this place today with a fresh joy in your step. That you walk into, into the parking lot. You go into your car and you go to the local restaurant this afternoon and the server who served you a hundred times before is going to notice something different, friends, because that's what Jesus does. He changes our lives. And the world notices. Don't kid yourself. The world notices. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, it says... 
The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortress. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing arised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When Satan brings his demoralizing attack, we need to fight back with the teachings and the promises of Jesus Christ found in the word of God. Friends, some of you need to get up in the morning with an ambitious desire to give the devil the biggest migraine he's ever had every day. If we feel ourselves to be vulnerable to this kind of attack from Satan, we need to find scriptures that challenge and defeat the destructive lies of Satan. Friends, if you need to take your Bible and you need to photocopy pages of it, if you need to write scriptures out and plaster every cupboard in your kitchen, if you need to put the scriptures on your toothbrush in the morning, do whatever it takes so that the word of God is getting into your heart, so that the, the full armor is on, so that when you go out into the world, you are ready. There are so many believers walking around without the armor of God. without being in that posture of being prepared. I want to close this morning by pointing out a few things that we should do to generate joy in our Christian lives. First, and quickly this morning, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 18, it says rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Three highlights found in this passage. When Satan tries to get you down on yourself, when he tries to discourage you and make you feel sorrow, rejoice. Rejoice. Open your Bible. Open your Bible and read the passages that some of them we've mentioned today. Rejoice in God's love and His faithfulness. I keep a long record of things. You may not know this, but I remember as a boy, my dad, he had this file, and he's here today. And he had this file, and I, th I think he called it the encouragement file, and I've kind of taken that. It wasn't copyright, so I took that. And so I've got an encouragement file in every single card I get. As I journey ministry, I put it in that file. Everything. And I've started recently to go a step further, and I now photograph it. Because I know if I take a digital photo, they're mine forever. The files could get destroyed, I'd still have the picture. And I look back on those to remember times of joy. Open up your songbook. Put on a CD. If you've evolved into the 21st century, turn on your MP3 player or your iPod. Or now we've gone a step further and you don't even need that stuff. You just need the Internet. And listen to uplifting music. Forget that other stuff, friends. Forget that other garbage that's on right now. You know, music is powerful. We're all affected by it at some degree. Remember how I said... It might be high time that we start becoming offended by the things that offend God. Let me tell you, there's a lot of music that good Christian people are listening to today that would be and is offensive to God. And you can't tell me, friends, that that's not going into your spirit somehow. Come on. This is real. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. 
tremendous wisdom in that. And don't forget to pray. Tell God what's going through your mind and what you're feeling. You can tell Him. Ask Him to bring you peace. You don't have to be ashamed. God already knows. Ask Him to put His arms of love around you. Ask Him to restore the spirit of joy in your life. You know what? He'll do it. He'll do it. And count your blessings and thank Him for them. Second, the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 12, it says, Let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking gall. And let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and the ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Friends, today, do not cease trying to live right. Do not give up. You will only feel worse. God's commandments, when performed, tend to give us happiness and joy. David says in the Psalms, Psalms 19, verse 8, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart. Trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. My heart goes out to all of those who are plagued with excessive sorrow. Do you know just how horrible it is until they find themselves having experienced it? I hope that the things that we have brought forth this morning may be of some help. And my prayer is, my prayer is today that we would know each moment the fresh joy the fresh joy of the Lord and be strengthened by it. The Lord wants to fill you with joy this morning. Would you stand with me today? Not an eye looking around in this place this morning. I want to ask a simple question today and that is this. You say, Pastor, as you were sharing this morning, as you were preaching this morning and giving this teaching, I, I don't feel like I have that joy that you're speaking of. I once did, maybe, but I don't have that joy this morning. If that's you, I'm not going to embarrass you today, but I do want to pray with you. You say, Pastor, I could use some prayer. One over here. Is there anyone else? We need some joy. We need the Lord to fill you. Another one over here. Okay, put your hands down. Lord, you've seen these hands. You see these hearts. And Lord, even the people this morning that have not raised their hands, you know their hearts. You know where they are right now. You know everything about us, Lord. You know the hairs that are on our head. And thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, I pray for a supernatural touch of your Holy Spirit to come and rest on each life that's here today, that, Lord, that you would fill each one of these lives and circumstances with a joy that is unspeakable this morning. Lord, we pray today for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit's power on each person. That, Lord, that each one today will leave different than when we came into this room this morning because, Lord, we are standing on holy ground today. And, Lord, if there are things in our lives that are counter to what the Word says, I pray, Lord, that you would deal with each of us in a way that only you can, with grace and love and compassion as we rest in you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And teach us to pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll see you tonight in Owen Sound.